What is going on, everyone? Welcome to this week's Part in the Disruption. We are excited for the show. Uh, clearly no mishaps pre, uh, pre-game here, so that's good. I'm your host, Matthew Potter. I'm your short sale guy, hedge fund connection, and also co-founder of the Family Tree over at Real Broker. If I'm able to help you grow your business in any way, reach out to me. We're going to go ahead and break down how we do things around here before intros. We have five pre-selected questions for our panelists. They will get 45 seconds uh, to answer, and then after that, two minutes to chop it up. Points will be awarded after that. The one with the most points at the end will ultimately win. Um, And then we have a sixth question that will come from our audience. So go ahead and chime in uh, on YouTube. Go ahead and make sure you head over to Pardon the Disruption on YouTube. We have our own channel there. Get in the chat and ask your question, and we'll go ahead and get it featured on here. We're going to start off today with Mr. Disruptor himself, Steve Trang. Introduce yourself. Steve Trang, Real Estate Disruptors. Uh, We solve sales problems. I am looking forward to today's uh, show. We already have Eric getting a little lippy as far as questioning (laughs) people's leadership style. And we got Mr. Leon Barnes talking about certainty uh, from his studio. So I'm really excited for today. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Brewer, go ahead and introduce yourself. We have the uh, mayor of York, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, admittedly, I'm going to give you a little warning. I'm a little cranky today. I'm working Uh-oh. on it. It starts, it starts with, <laughs> I'm going to apologize in advance, uh, but it starts with awareness. Um, Leon clearly has the best. I can't tell if that's a, a screensaver, if that's his actual backdrop. <laughs> it's, it's pretty dope. Looks like he deserves his own show. Um, Mr. Hedgehog himself is joining us today, RJ. Um, the opposite of a hedgehog, Potter's got 17 jobs. He's the hedge fund connection, the host, <laughs> the short sale guy. Like it's he's got the lack of focus. Whatever the lack, whatever the opposite of a hedgehog is, that's him. Like a butterfly, I'm thinking. Um, I'm... And then there's Steve, Mister Unforgettable. So uh, he's here with us today. So I'm just excited to, to to be here. I think I'll be less cranky when the show ends. That, that's wonderful. Thank you for giving us your uh, heads up there, Brewer. And yes, I am consistent as a tree. I appreciate that. You know, it's called being diver- you know, diverse in what you do. You struggle uh, with the right word selection there. I like the recovery, though. It was divert and then and divert. No. But you did good just to glaze right over it. Just ding, don't make ding, eye contact and ding. keep walking. Next up. The classiest panel member that we always have. We have Leon G. Barnes. Go ahead and introduce yourself. What's up, everyone? I was just going to say that you you started off by saying that Steve is Mr. PTW, uh, PTD. I'm starting to believe that I am. I got on a plane this morning, saw the bat signal, the PTD bat signal come up that I needed to, to fill in today. So I found the studio here in Denver, and I'm thinking about moving to Denver just because this studio it's so nice that I uh, may have to use this from here on out. Excited to be here today and uh, excited to turn Mr. Cranky Pants into Mr. <laughs> Mr. The, the Eric Brewer that we all know. Yes, the the lovable brewer that everybody <laughs> always, you know, just dodes on. Last, certainly not least, we have Mr. R.J. Bates III. Go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> You got muted, bro. You got you muted. All that time to Come prepare. on now. Oh, oh man. Yeah. That, listen, y'all must have done that from backstage or something. I don't know what just happened there. <laughs> uh, RJ Bates, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, excited to be back. I missed last week. I was actually pretty excited. I had not missed, I think, in like eight months or something like that. It was it was a pretty long streak. So uh, still recovering from my Jovid 24 uh aka a cold um still trying to get over it but uh looking forward to being back and i'm excited that eric's cranky because uh i missed a good battle with eb so looking forward to today <laughs> i didn't even notice rj wasn't here last week wow well, I, I also I'm noticed tired. that you you didn't say anything about me today in your intro so that was cool <laughs> <laughs> all right we're gonna go ahead and get into it with question number one with the NFL kickoff starting today, which NFL team would you say mirrors your team's business style or values? Start us off, Steve. Um, I I would go with uh, the New England Patriots. You know, I like everyone to have a role, do your job, right? That's it. Focus on the task at hand. Focus on what's in front of you. 
And we like to bring in our misfits, people that don't quite fit in necessarily elsewhere and crush it in our organization. And I'll highlight Captain Misfit himself, Mr. Matthew Potter. Um, the guy has done some amazing things. And I don't think there are a lot of organizations that will tolerate Matthew, right? <laughs> but we bring him here and he gets a lot done for the organization. Solid point, sir. And I appreciate being known as Captain Misfit. I'm going to add that to my intro next week for Brewer just to give him, you know, something else to think about. Little known All fact, right. Eric Brewer is Captain Angry Pants in our group chat. So move on. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Outstanding. All right, Brewer, what about you? What NFL team are you taking? This is a tough question, but first and foremost, I do agree with Steve Trang. Um, the Patriots could be the most boring team in the NFL, and at the helm is Mac Jones. I think Steve jo Steve is like the Mac Jones of, of real estate and sales. <laughs> He's got a similar build, skill set, complexion. Um, actually, I think Steve's a little whiter than Mac Jones, but um, I'm reminded of our team uh, of the Rams, um, and maybe not these Rams, but the Rams um, that Kurt Warner, Marshall Falk um, played on. Some people know it as the greatest show on turf. Um, I think that resembles a lot of our team. Um, we, we are very visible on social media. We operate with a ton of energy. Um, we are constantly looking to push the ball down the field. And, uh, you know, we win more than we lose. That team didn't win a series of five Super Bowls, but uh, they did win one. And uh, I think we win more than we lose. Uh, we try and create an exciting atmosphere here that moves quickly and is very Dang. rewarding um, to skilled players. So I would say we're kind of like the Rams. There we go. Thank you for respecting mm -hmm. the ding as well. We appreciate that, Brewer. Greatest show on turf <clears throat> back when uh, Brewer was the greatest show back in 99. Absolutely. All right. Leon, what about you? Well, I'd love to tell you that uh, we are my favorite team, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs, but I am no Patrick Mahomes, and nor do I have, in, in, in my opinion, that type of performer or have in the past. For me, uh, although it pains me to say this, um, it's Pittsburgh Steelers. And the reason why I, I feel that way is just from consistency. That franchise has had since 1969 three head coaches. In my lifetime, they've had three head coaches. They are a model of consistency. They're not flashy. They typically don't spend a lot of money on, on big names and free agency. They make some trades here and there, but they just are the model of consistency, even when they're bad. Mike Tomlin's never had a losing record in his head coaching career. Even when they're bad, they find a way to win. Uh, and they happen to be tied for the most Super Bowl champions, championships uh, in the NFL. So the Pittsburgh Steelers' model of consistency is how I like to uh, – who would I compare us to? Very nice, very nice. I, I like seeing this from uh, everybody. I'm interested to see what RJ's uh, <clears throat> NFL team is going to be over here. All right, RJ, what about you? Yeah, so I'm actually going to throw myself under the bus here. Uh, I'm going to go with the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I'm going to go all the way back uh, to my ch my childhood when Jerry Jones took over and he immediately won. And, and when you look at titanium investments, that's what we did. We came out of the gates and we immediately won. And then I made mistakes and Jerry Jones made mistakes. And then we kind of hit this lull and it's kind of like, hey, I've got to find a way to get back to being the owner I was when I didn't know shit about shit. Like now, for whatever reason, because I know I have wisdom and I know what I'm actually doing, I make mistakes. I get in my own way. And I think that's kind of where Jerry Jones is. And he's been there. Um, hopefully this year it's different for the Cowboys and, and same thing here at Titanium. But I, I think if I had to be realistic about where we are, that's that's the best team that I could compare myself to. I think the difference here is is the humility. And I think Jerry Jones, if someone can help him find a little bit, then they, would, they might be winning. 
I would you know, agree with that. It was very self-reflective of you. I was going to say a joke there and call you R- – instead of R.J. Jones, I was going to car- call you more like Barry Switzer, so like R.J. Switzer. <laughs> there you go. There I you see go. you more in that realm, but you were very self-reflective there, so I'll stay away from the jokes. Yeah. I think well, a good I- exercise might be for us to name the team that we think best resembles – each guy, each of us, right? <laughs> I got RJ down for the Eagles. I, it was the, it came right to like mine, right? Oh. Like abrasive, potty <laughs> mouth. <laughs> ah, we suck. We're the best. There's no in between. I got stuck on everybody else. Oh, um, man. I was trying to think of like boring and like loser for track. I couldn't think. What's the least winningest franchise in NFL history? Tampa Bay Bucks. Bucks. Tampa Bay I, Bucks. I was actually Detroit Lions. Brewer, I was thinking about the Cleveland Browns for you. Like, <laughs> we all have such high hopes and nothing what's ever their, happens. What's their fan base called? What do they call it? The dog, dog pound. pound. The dog pound. Yeah. It's not bad. It's not bad. They're not the That's losing this franchise. Prior Bernie to Super Bowl Kozar. era, they were one of the most winningest franchises. Ernest been a while. Steiner, Bernie Kozar. It's been a while. That's for not sure. Much good comes out of Cleveland. <laughs> hey by the way rj ask eric who his favorite fan base is it's philadelphia yes of course it is it's like the opposite <laughs> i mean it could be like uh what was that um was it the the raiders or recently or niners they're just fighting themselves right niners fans raider. fighting niners fans. Raider. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> raider fan is of all the fans raider fan is the one that i can uh, see rj as a raider fan with that like the get up that they wear it's not much different than the yeah the, the, that's the, true the, the spikes, the spikes on, the, on the shoulders yeah. he probably wears that behind the scenes anyway with leather chaps with the <laughs> cheeks cut out yeah when he's wrestling, <laughs> when he's wrestling. that's right ultimate warrior <laughs> you'll see it in Tampa. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, this is gonna be great. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so based off that round, um I you know, I have a little bit of an in insider uh you know connection here, I guess. I'm gonna give the point to uh Steve because yes, I've seen the just do your job. Uh it has been a mantra, honestly, since probably Stunning Homes even opened its doors back in the day. But I'm definitely super excited that Eric Brewer is Cleveland Browns, you know, best fan. And, you know, RJ is going over to Raider Nation. So that's awesome. It's better right. than the Cowboys. It is definitely better than the Cowboys. Uh, next up, question number two. What area in real estate do you feel has untapped potential to grow? Start us off, Steve. You know, I posted something this week, and it's directly, it directly came from part of the disruption. It's something Eric said on one of the episodes. And it was basically, you know, why aren't we working more with realtors? And so right now, I think this, you, you've heard people talking about buying deals off the MLS, working with realtors, realtor connection, this and that. I see an evolution in the next few years, maybe five years tops, where the wholesaler, the guy sourcing the deals uh, and, and realtors are basically doing the same thing. So I think the biggest untapped potential is getting these two worlds to marry and showing both sides how they could do more business, realtors doing more investments, investors doing more, uh, working more with realtors to, to, to source deals. So I think that's the biggest untapped potential. Very good. And also shout out to Brewer on giving Steve a good idea. We appreciate that. It was his yeah. only good answer in this hey, history of PTD. Sometimes all it takes is one, man. Sometimes all it takes is one. And that's just how you, you know, take it down. All right, bro. Steve. <laughs> well, what are your thoughts on this? Um, that's one of them. Um, you know, I actually just had lunch today with a real estate agent and they were asking me all of these questions. And, and it's funny because they always ask, why wouldn't they just list it? And I said, because you guys do a horrible job of letting people know that you can help them. When was the last time you saw a sign from a realtor that said, I list ugly houses? It doesn't exist. You've had your nose up in the air for 15 years and you only wanted perfectly staged high value listings that you could take really good pictures for and sell. I do think it's a, a really big untapped market. Um, what we're doing is we're going to actually educate real estate agents on how to market and work with, with, with investors. Um, it requires a lot of faith, right? Like it feels like I shouldn't be doing it because I'm letting the secret out of the bag. Um, and if real estate agents get good at that, why would they need us? 
but there's still a lot to be done. You got to renovate the house. They still don't know how to disposition it to an investor. They don't know how to talk to investors the way that RG, RJ's team does. They don't know how to analyze a cash flowing asset. Uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But I do think there's a huge opportunity for investors and real estate agents to co-mingle rather than always being at each other's throats. Um, I think there's a massive opportunity and, and I'm with Steve. I'm going to continue to charge down that path. And if I'm wrong, so be it. If I'm right, I think we'll be out ahead of the curve. Ding, ding. All right, Leon, what are your thoughts? I love that answer. I think that both of those guys uh, gave you a really good answer there on untapped. I think another one that I've seen recently uh, since I'm filling in for CJ today, um, you know, Affordable housing is something that is. I know. There it I know is. That, uh, <laughs> CJ, CJ would bring up, and I'm having more and more conversations with investors that maybe they went down the Airbnb route, but now are looking at okay, my market doesn't have enough affordable options, and so they're looking into pad splitting, or they're looking into tiny homes. They're looking to solve a problem. Look at most billionaires. At some point, they solved a major gap or void in the marketplace. And clearly, we know in almost every major metro and even secondary markets that affordable housing is something that is just less available. And so that pad splitting, uh, tiny homes, RV parks, um, mobile home parks, I'm seeing more and more niche into that area away from the hospita hospitality play that a lot of people were playing to get uh, the, the numbers to, to, to work. Well, those numbers are starting to work in a more affordable options for those markets that they're in. That's a, that's a great point. I mean, I know we joke about affordability, but let's be honest, it's, not a lot's it's, affordable it's real. right now. It's, it's real. like, it is, it's, it's real. It is. Uh, Mr. Affordable himself, RJ Bates, what are your thoughts on this? This is, uh, this is interesting. What area in real estate do you feel has untapped potential First two guys said, working with realtors. <laughs> oh, boy. I mean, that's it's like the the number one way to do real estate. It's the way majority of real estate deals are done. I just wanted to start off my answer by saying I couldn't disagree more with both of them. <laughs> um, I think it's raw, vacant land. I mean, we, we always talk about the shortage of homes, right? The inventory that we have available and there's so much untapped land that is not being purchased that could be purchased on terms cj talks about this if you don't know how to talk to people and and create deals by buying them on terms case in point i'm able to buy i'm buying actually next week 110 acres in wyoming for 200 dollars a month essentially that can lead to potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars of passive income based off of the mineral rights that are on that. There is so much opportunity across our country to buy vacant land that I think we just ignore um, and we're not even looking at it as a possibility. Um, I think that is far more untapped than working with a realtor. Once again, great. RJ Perks, he's more interested in being funny than being right. Like you're talking <laughs> about uh, raw vacant land. Everybody here, every house, every mall, every highway at some point has been tapped into as raw vacant land. All the homes that you're selling and wholesaling and all of that, every structure that exists at one point was, was raw vacant land and it got developed by someone. Just because it's been untapped by you doesn't mean that it hasn't been tapped into by multiple people for generations and generations. And I think, RJ, just what we were talking about as far as with realtors, I agree with you, right? Most people, when they want to buy a property, their first thought is with realtors. What what we're talking about is the disconnect or the there's this tension between investors and wholesalers uh, and, and investors and realtors. There's like an us versus them mindset. And if we can bridge that gap and show them what the opportunity is and we could be the person that they're thinking of when they're sending deals, right? I think educating them versus dismissing them or, or, or thinking we're better than them and actually educating them will lead to way more uh, opportunities. I mean, Eric and I we were talking yesterday. He's got, I don't know, some stupid number of deals <laughs> that he's getting from realtors for innovations. 
I would never have thought a realtor would send a novation deal. <laughs> but it's happening when you educate them on what the value is. My point is, is I don't think that that is untapped. I, mm -hmm. I think it is. It's very it's spoken about very frequently. Realtors are working with investors. It's not that there's this huge gap there. My mm -hmm. point is on the vacant land is that that is more often than not dismissed by most investors. Like we should not be paying attention to it. Case in point, Eric came back and said, all of these houses and malls and strip centers and all of this is what, what was it? It was vacant land at one point in time. I just saw J.R. Hernandez out of San Antonio posted a reel today where he asked the guy, what's the biggest assignment fee you've ever gotten? He said, $700,000. He said, how'd you do that? I locked up 93 acre parcel for 900,000 and I assigned it for 1.6 million. You can't do that with deals that a realtor is bringing you on a single family home or even a small multifamily. That is my point. I think it's untapped <clears throat> potential because people aren't going after it. RJ, why don't we get agents to bring us vacant, unentitled land? And then we can do both. Because agents aren't really going after that, to be honest with you. But they don't go after fixer uppers. That's kind of my point. Like what Steve and I are saying to drill down a little bit more. I think you do see agents and investors that work together, maybe more so now than it was five years ago. What I'm specifically talking about is how many of them know how to go pull a, a good data set? How many of them know how to message and communicate with a motivated seller the way that we do? Very few to none. They accidentally get a listing that they think uh, might be good for an investor. And hopefully we have a relationship and they give us an opportunity to buy it. Or it's a listing that's been sitting for six months and we make a low offer on it and they're able to get their seller to sign because they're out of patience. It's been too long. They no longer have the option to wait. What I'm specifically saying is train them to do that. Train them to go after entitled land, train them to message those people, train them how to pull the list. And what, what, what makes me feel like that's a good way to, to, to do it is that I think if you have someone from Remax, that's a licensed agent that, you know, has this, this brand behind them and they message that same seller, with a similar message that we have, but they're a licensed agent, I think 75% of people would, would gravitate towards that licensed person if they felt that they could get the service that they now have to rely on an investor from. So I'm kind of saying the same, whether it's entitled land or you want entitled land or that stuff, leverage a real estate agent to get you in front of more of those people. I, I would say this, that, that's, that's a great answer. For me... I just don't have a ton of respect for the position. I, they're not educated and they, they barely know more than the uneducated wholesaler. I mean, you're talking about two weeks of classes and a test. Okay. They're not experts. There are really good ones. And that's why we have the, that's why there's day. potential. Yeah. I, just, I think that's what creates the, the need. For well, what? We know who it's won't be tapping license. Potential. <laughs> what is the reason why I'm going to them? Why wouldn't I just teach my team and more people, investors to do it? Why am RJ, I adding a barrier to entry? Who, with a who, third party? who do you rank lower? Lead you managers or realtors? I'm you trying to figure both. out. Bro, seriously? <laughs> that would Ouch. be a hard battle. I mean, I'm, I'm on. Ouch. We're just two faced it. Heads, it's realtors. All right. <laughs> Holy shit, it's realtors. <laughs> Congratulations, lead managers. You found someone you can beat. Um, so that was rather entertaining. Uh, point not to RJ uh, for, you know, absolutely assaulting me over here. I, that, that being said, RJ, RJ, I got nothing but love for you. You know that I'm, I'm that 1% that's not the 99%. Um, on the untapped side, Look, I see exactly what Steve and Eric are talking about. Yes, there does exist this. Everything needs to kind of come together, and I think that you will see that progression over the next five years. But untapped at this moment, I'm with my man Leon on this. Affordability, there has to be creation of affordability, and that may be through some kind of joint partnerships, land, all of that, but that is the untapped potential that is going to occur probably over the next five to seven is creating effectively – Something that just doesn't break the back of, you know, the of just America right now. So, you know, points uh, 
No. Nope. Sorry, real quick before you move forward. Just for everyone that's interested in what Leon's talking about, I don't know anyone doing this better than Michael Fitzgerald. Right? I would say, you know, look him up. That guy is getting money from the government to create affordable housing. So mm -hmm. that's the direction you want to go. Definitely check out Michael Fitzgerald. There we go. All right. Shout Next up. <laughs> Next up, question number three. Everyone in the wholesale space preaches that people should start wholesaling through driving for dollars, cold calling, pulling lists, etc. But truly, what is the best way to begin as a wholesaler in real estate? Start us off, Leon. Uh, frankly, I don't think any of those are bad. Any of that is bad advice. Um, I think it's all cheap opportunity to low barrier of entry of getting in. Um, but you know, I'm in Denver um, uh, for RJ's favorite club, the Well Club, and a lot of what we discuss in this club is, you know, starting with the end in mind. You know, what your goals are, and obviously, if you're looking to grow a wholesaling business, reverse engineering will allow you to do a lot of these things that are low barrier of entry quickly to identify who your buyers are. So. What I came up with is doing a simple Zillow search, finding out who your buyers are, who are landlords in specific areas, and then driving for dollars rather than just driving for dollars, rather than just pulling lists, actually having a buyer in, in place before you start that journey of going down the driving for dollars and other, other, these other techniques of, of getting sellers. Very nice. Very nice. All right, RJ, what are your thoughts on this? Obviously, budget is going to play a, a role in this. Um, the best way to get started is is by consistently and constantly being on the phone with sellers. Um, the first step in, in your wholesale business is by acquiring the deals. You could essentially JV with the New Westerns, the Key Glees, you know, uh, these big box wholesalers for the rest of your life if you are good at acquiring deals. You don't ever really have to get good at transaction coordination and dispositions if you don't want to. Um, but you have to find a way to acquire deals. You have to get comfortable solving people's problems. And so whether that budget aligns you to afford inbound leads where you're getting something from like a lead Zolo or speed to lead where you're constantly talking to warm leads that obviously is the number one way, but if you can't afford that, then cold calling is, is going to be a way. It's just going to take you a little bit longer. You're going to have to get a lot more no's before you get the yeses. Awesome. Don't, don't forget affiliate link there. Titanium investments over there, you know. <laughs> All right, Steve, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I'm going to echo a lot of what uh, Leon and R RJ said. Uh, it really comes down to your personal situation. Um, if you're a person that doesn't like conflict or doesn't like talking to people, it's pretty hard to encourage you to go start picking the phone and cold calling people, right? You got to figure out what you're good at. If you have a background in door knocking before, keep door knocking. Um, if you're the kind of person that does enjoy you know, talking to people, do the cold calling thing, right? If you're the kind of person that just likes relationships, go to events. Talk to other people that have deals. So it really comes down to what you like to do. Um, you know, one of the things we've talked about in the past is if you, if you already are doing Uber or these, I guess these days, DoorDash, whatever you're driving around all day, add uh, driving for dollars, figure out what you're doing already and what you like to do. And then use that to uh, transition to uh, into wholesaling. There we go. I like that. All right. Good job, Steve. Glad to glad to see you bring your a game today. All right, Brewer. What are your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Mac Jones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, this Captain might not be Cranky the most popular pants. answer, but like, if you're thinking about wholesaling, let's get to the grassroots of why I think the majority of people are considering moving in that direction. They don't have leads, they lack experience, and they have limited budget or money like RJ referred to. So I actually agree with what everybody said, but I think the way you should start your wholesaling journey is going to work for someone that's already doing the business that has leads. You'll gain experience in an accelerated format there without failing your way to experience. And you're going to be able to make enough money. Listen, if you, whether it's a lead manager and acquisitions, a dispo guy, um, you should be able to make six figures quickly. And if you're managing your budget correctly after two years or so, you're going to have 
the knowledge to generate leads. You're going to have two years worth of experience and you should have saved up enough money where if cold calling is not your thing, you don't have to cold call. RJ mentioned a couple of really good lead sources there. Having that money allows you to operate where you want to operate. Maybe you're great at acquisitions, but you don't love the prospecting, uh, the cold calling and the networking. So I think you should start your journey finding someone in your market that does a good job. Go there. Be honest about your intentions. Work for two years. And when you have the ability to generate leads, you have a budget and money that you've set aside to start your business. And now you have reasonable experience. Then I would consider going out on my own. So I think Eric makes a, a, an incredible point. Um, one thing, if that's the direction you go, just make sure you evaluate your agreement wherever you join to understand. Right? You got to be totally transparent, but understand you talk about exit strategies on houses, <laughs> understand your exit strategies. Right. And, and if you work for RJ, you don't have to worry about a non-compete. Everybody else, I believe, uh, from a past show, we, we well, actually, Steve, you don't do no, no competes either, do you? Uh, we do now. <laughs> <laughs> what a push Wait, when did that start? <laughs> I can't believe you jumped off the bandwagon. Yeah. Uh, listen, uh, read your agreement, Matthew. <laughs> if uh, if you want to apply to be a part of Eric's 1999 St. Louis Rams team, you can apply at application at ifhbuyers.com. Good job, Eric. Here we go. Way one, to teach people how to get it started on their own journey. One thing that I want to add is no matter if you go that route, obviously, if you go that route, you're going to be working for a company. But if you go out on your own, and you take a driving for dollar strategy or something along those lines of calling landlords, asking them specifically what they're looking for in certain zip codes and those type of things that I was talking about earlier. The one thing that I'm surprised that Eric didn't mention that I've heard him mention before, especially for new people, is just documentation of everything, right? That personal brand that you develop on the social media side, whatever you're doing, make sure that you're documented to start to build that brand. Even if you haven't purchased your first or assigned your first deal, that's an easy way to let people know beyond just your local RIAs and your local area that, you know, in your, there's so many people that would you know, be able to see that as you continue to build your brand. Very good. Very good. All right. We're going to go ahead and award, uh, we're going to award everybody's third favorite Texan uh, with the point for this, uh, for this round, because yeah, it is, it starts out with budget. Like, let's be honest, it, that's what everything's driven on, and then it goes from there. Uh, real quick, before we get into question four, word from our sponsor. This episode of Pardon the Disruption is sponsored by the Family Tree of Real Broker. If you are looking to make a change in your real estate business, check out therealfamilytree.com and schedule your collaboration call with us. We will help you grow your real estate business. All right, getting into question number four. We have... What is your favorite city to invest in and why? Start us off, RJ. Potter, you know which Closers Olympics belt is my favorite? <laughs> the last the next one? one? The, the next. next one, baby. Yeah. Let, let's go. Same, same thing here. I mean, listen, it, there are cities that we do have, like, an affection to. Like, hey, Dallas, Fort Worth. San Francisco. Worth. Yeah. Oh, man. Don't get me started, Potter. Um, you know, DFW, we've obviously done the majority of our deals. It's where we're based out of. It's where we got started. It's easier for us to get referrals here because we're known better. You know, it, it's going to be a lot harder for me to get a referral in, you know, some random city in, in Maine or New Hampshire, but we've had success in Maine and New Hampshire. And so for me, I've never really gotten too tied to a specific location uh, because we are nationwide and I preach this all the time, I think people can almost get uh, like mentally stuck when they're trying to figure out what market they want to be in and why. And it's more about, hey, let's go out and let's take action and you will start building credibility in those markets. There we go. Well thought out. Thank you, RJ. All right. What about you, Steve? What's your uh, favorite city to invest in? Uh, so I don't have a really uh, favorite city. Um, I would say I've always been envious of those in the Midwest. You know, you get to see these guys that are sourcing deals that they get to keep more of. They get to burr, right? So there, I think there are a lot of very quiet, extremely wealthy friends we have in the Midwest because they've been buying properties and keeping them and having them cash flow and they've owned them, right? 
uh, we had a, a someone that came on uh, a real estate disruptors. We're like, hey, how'd you do? Like, how'd you fare? He's like, well, I got caught with 150 properties when the interest rates changed. It's like, how'd you do? It's like, oh, I just pulled out equity from my properties. Right? It was just a non-issue because of how much wealth he had acquired over the years. So I, I shame on me. I haven't invested in the Midwest yet, but uh, that's something that I have a plan to do sometime in the in the in the near future. Honorable mention to uh, Jimmy V today. Shout out to Jimmy. Um, you know, buying up eight thousand dollar properties all day. Yeah, become all a multimillionaire, right. eight thousand dollar properties at a time. Dude, I'm here for it. All right, Brewer, what are you? What's your favorite city? I think it's tough. I, I think there's always going to be, like RJ said, this uh, bias towards local, and I think that's really what, what you have to balance are two things: predictability and margin. Right. Like in my hometown, there's a ton of predictability. I know values. I know who to sell it to. Um, we can make quick decisions. Um, but we generally operate with smaller margin. Right. Where if I go to like Tampa, Florida, now there's more margin and it's less predictable. If I go to Atlanta, Georgia, same thing. Right. Um, super popular market, higher price. Um lower predictability. So I think what my general advice for someone that is starting out, if that's the context of the question is probably start in your hometown, right? Get some, some experience, um, know how to dispo a deal, understand how to evaluate and underwrite a deal, and then move to where there might be higher volume of, of deal possibilities at a higher margin. But I think you constantly have to have those two things in mind, a balance of predictability and a balance of margin. Brewer always dropping dropping a nugget for us. We like it. All right, Leon, what are your thoughts on this favorite city? I'm glad I got to follow Eric because he just described exactly the model that I've been running personally for 10 years now, which is buying in the Midwest, specifically in my home market of Wichita, where I'm where I moved to Tampa from. But what he just described is exactly what I've been thinking about over the last three years lived in Tampa for three years and I've continued to watch Tampa being the top three of where Americans are moving to. Phoenix is one of those markets. Las Vegas is another one of those markets. And so there's tremendous upside. So I have my certainty in Wichita with buying properties there, fixing and flipping them and putting over half of those generally on an annual basis into my portfolio to Steve's point. You can do that in the markets like St. Louis and Wichita and Kansas City and Oklahoma City and Little Rock, Tulsa. Those are great Midwest markets for burst strategy. Um, but I'm looking at upside in markets like the Tampa Bay area um, because of how many people are moving consistently for the last four years, Tampa has been in the top three. So what Eric just described is exactly what I'm looking at. And so today it is my home market, but in the future, there's opportunity for upside there. It may be Tampa. I just want to point out that the question was, what is your favorite city to invest in? And Steve gave a geographical location in the United States that includes 12 <laughs> states. Yes, I did. Great job, Steve. I knew I wasn't going to win this one. I just wanted to share. <laughs> I, I just wanted to share my regrets. That's all. I knew all I wasn't right. going to win this one because I'm not doing it. <laughs> That's Steve G that's Steve's Thursday morning affirmations. I know I'm not going to win this one, but we're still going to go in and we're going to try. It. Hey, that that sounds a lot like Mac Jones. That sounds a lot like uh, <laughs> trying to channel my inner inner cowboys. <laughs> trying to channel Big my inner vanilla. cowboys. I apologize. <laughs> we got we got Mac Trang in the house over here. <laughs> Mac Trang's job is to come in and finish in a solid third place every Thursday. There he is. Bobby Bronze. I'm trying to win, just getting five questions right. My job is not to win the show, but you know I don't want to lose it, but I definitely don't want it. Win it, win it. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Third Place, also known as Barry Bronze. <laughs> <laughs> not gold, not silver, but bronze. Barry Bronze, there he is. All right, sit me between RJ and Eric in Tampa. We're going to go to town. You'll uh, sit where we tell you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You might, I might bounce you up and down on my knee for the whole show, like a little, like a little boy. Five five Eric even Burr. Go, bum, bitty, bum, bitty, bum, bitty, bum, bum. Wow. Five five, five Eric Burr is going to try to hold me. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Just the 
absolute savagery there of Brewer bouncing Steve on his knee. Brewer, you're going to get the point. And I want you to give Steve the biggest hug I've ever seen in my entire life uh, live when we're in uh, – when we're in Tampa, that's what that's well, what needs to if happen. You want to remember your Tampa trip? I would suggest against hugging me. <laughs> I I really suggest that you do this, Brewer. Um, all right. Question number five. They say great leaders attract great talent, and Deion Sanders has seemed to attract top recruits to join the Colorado football program because of his leadership style. As a leader, what do you do to consistently level up your leadership skills? Start us off, Brewer. Man, this is a million dollar question. Um, you know what? And I think everybody here has done a good job of either um, continuing to, to grow as a leader. And, um, you know, I've had some interaction with, uh, I think it's Josh on RJ's team. And everybody here always compliments um, how organized he is and how well he communicates. And, um, you know, Leon and I work together at, at Collective Genius and he's surrounded by extraordinary um, people there and, and members and um, it's everything. I, I did a presentation on this a couple months ago at a mastermind. And, uh, I literally said leadership is a life and death situation. You can look at almost every company, every, uh, Olympic team, every war, every marriage, every friendship, and it hinges on good leadership or bad leadership. Um, so the, what I do to ensure that I'm constantly evolving as a leader, I surround myself with other leaders like guys on this show and Potter. I also <laughs> negative one continue. I, I work on it, right? You have, you have to work on it. Like you have to intentionally try and level up as a leader. And, and, and there's books that you can read. There's podcasts. You may laugh, but like I get tons of little snippets off of TikTok. Like, and, and it's worked for me because it's like little 20 second doses of stuff that I can get and I'll watch it. I'll absorb it. And then I go Dang. try and do a good job of it. So um, you got to work on it. And, and, and by the way, it's not a little deal. It's life or death. Dang. <laughs> Maybe next time you can be a leader of finishing on time. I don't know. Maybe you should bring a buzzer to the show. I mean, you uh, have, we you need, have Hey, you need to talk, you need to talk to your friend, buzzer. Steve over you don't there. Even have right? enough like, by the way, the buzzer has more bass. Dang. Is that better? Is that what you wanted to hear, bro? <laughs> yeah. That tranny buzz you gave there. A minute ago. <laughs> wow. All right. Sorry, Our, I told you I was cranky. You get man, jeez. Right, <laughs> somebody, somebody, give that man a snack. Jeez. Sorry. All right, Leon. I well, <laughs> what about you? What are you doing to disassociate from Brewer and be a better leader? What are you well, doing? I was just about to say I, I surround myself with Eric Brewer, but I don't know. I might have to take that back after that. Um, <laughs> well, first and foremost, this question: I mean, How much does leadership mean? Um, look at what Dion has done with the University of Colorado. I know it's one game, but they only won one game last season. Leadership matters. And the givens are that you commit to it, right? You commit to educating yourself. You're reading every single day. You're surrounding yourself with like-minded individuals. The physical as well as the mental is so important to leadership. If you're not in good physical shape, it's very hard uh, to lead. Um, and, you know, the, the mental side of it is obviously is, is super important, but to Eric's point, you know, I, in the next three weeks, will surround myself here in Denver with like-minded entrepreneurs that are also on a leadership journey because it's, you never get to the end. It's always a journey and you're always looking to get better. I'm here in Denver this week. I'm in California in a week and a half, surrounded by great leaders that are entrepreneurs that are in the real estate space. And then I'm, I'm with you guys in Tampa in, in three weeks and just always surrounding myself with people that are trying to be better leaders. If you're not working on leadership, more than likely, that's not going to be a long-term relationship for me. Solid. We appreciate so sorry, it, Leon. We, we, <laughs> we appreciate that. All right, RJ, what are you doing on the leadership side? I think first and foremost, you have to listen. You have to listen to your peers. You have to listen to your team. You have to listen to your family. Listen to the feedback of the person that you're becoming. Um, constantly be taking that feedback and, and trying to become the the version of yourself that you you want to look back and say that was the legacy that I left. Right. That that's who I was as a person. Um, and are you taking steps every day to become that person? Um, and then also have the unwavering confidence 
that when things aren't going right, I talked earlier about the, the Jerry Jones aspect for me, right? I've had every reason in the world to, to shut this down, to, to give up on the dream that I have, to say I'm not the person. I've had people, close friends, close family members say, You've, you failed, you messed up, you made mistakes, you should have given up. You have to have the confidence to stand there and say, no, I just didn't make the right decision at that time and, and take action to fix that along the way. I think if you do that, you'll look back and you'll be proud of the, the legacy that you've left. RJ get, getting us in the fields today on a Thursday. I like it. All right, Steve, what are your thoughts? Um, I think it's a combination of a couple of different things. Um, I think it's intentionally surrounding yourself with the right people. Right. And I think the other part is actively investing in it. And in this case, you know, we're talking about collective genius. I get to hang out with Eric and Leon and Jimmy on a regular basis. And then a family mastermind uh, in a few short weeks can be hanging out with uh, all these guys and RJ and Chris Jefferson. Right. <laughs> so we're going to be able to surround ourselves with the right people. I think that's the first thing. Uh, but then as far as investing, I mentioned before, uh, we hired SEAL team leaders, right? We hired Larry Yash to come in and coach up all the leaders in our companies, right? So investing in our company, investing in our people, uh, we've, we've gone through Sharper, we've gone through um, uh, Darren Hardy's leadership training. So we've actively worked on our leadership uh, consistently. And I think that's the most single most valuable skill as a business owner. You know, we teach sales. I think sales is super important. Leadership, I think, is the difference between all major organizations. The The team can only go as far as the leader can take them. But I, but I think it's important to, to understand, Steve, like you talked a lot about surrounding yourself with the right people and, and getting training for it. But it's about when you come back, you have to become that person. You have to implement and, and take action on it. Like you can fall into this. I mean, let's be honest, Eric talked about it, books, podcasts, there's a lot out there when it comes mm -hmm. to leadership. You can fall into this just like I'm constantly becoming a better leader because I'm hearing about it, but you have to go out and, and practice it and get the feedback from your team about whether or not you actually are becoming that better leader. Did I just question that I'm not doing, doing it? Is that, is that what just happened here? <laughs> To that, to that point, RJ, I do think this is why I, I enjoy reading about leadership, but man, I love uh, being in front of it more. So I feel like I gain more, like my favorite leaders are coaches that I've had in business as well, mostly in sports, but just watching their actions, you know, just like I'm, we're leaders for our kids, right? Our kids look up to us every single day and so your actions mean so much and so when i'm around guys like eric and i'm watching he's sending me a text at five in the morning because he's getting up and he's going on a bike ride um he's getting his mind right for that morning and then he's reading I'm like i'm i'm just following the the, the that uh, blueprint to success to becoming a better leader so surrounding yourself and then taking notes and actually applying that to your point is, is so important. I love being around great leaders because it's easy for me to incorporate that quickly. <clears throat> I must've accidentally unsubscribed from Eric's messages for 5.00 AM leadership. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how I did that. I apologize that I accidentally unsubscribed from that. Maybe because I called you captain angry pants in the group text. Um, the other thing too <laughs> is, uh, you know, we talk about, uh, I mean, we do the sales training and the sales training, a big part of it is the actual communication right? Between two different parties. And as far as the leadership, the one thing that's really helped me a lot doing the sales component is I can really understand what, what they're trying to tell us. We can speak in a way that encourages feedback versus a way that accidentally, you know, we talk about uh, the multipliers book, accidental diminishing. Uh, we can make sure that we're pulling the most out of people and we can absorb it versus shutting down feedback. Because I've said for years, I want feedback. And it wasn't until the last two or three years that I actually learned that even though I was saying I want feedback, I was not responding well to feedback, and it was stifling uh, dissent uh, uh, unintentionally. As someone that's rolled with Steve for 10, 15, however many years, I can certainly confirm that feedback was never welcomed <laughs> up until maybe a couple of years ago. On an unrelated note, taking this one to the chat, 
I I think everybody did did really good on this. That being said, uh, everybody's ta- everybody's feeling uh, RJ's answer on this. So point to uh, to Mr. Dallas Fort Worth there. Good good stuff. All right, we're going into question How did number. The worst s- leader win. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. All right, so good. Br- bring your trash talking to question number six. What's the most costly mistake you've made so far in your career? Go ahead and start us off, RJ. Uh, I mean, most costly mistake was probably the time. Well, actually, the two times I bought plane tickets to fly out to Phoenix to be on real estate disruptors. I mean, realistically, when you think about it, what a complete waste of my time. <laughs> <laughs> Costly. <laughs> All right. Bring your trash talk. Um, I, the most costly mistake for me was when I made the decision to go away from strictly virtual wholesaling to become both a flipper and a landlord without having the education on how to do that and that, without having the systems and the processes to do that. When I talk about the Jerry Jones and the mistakes and all that, it all goes back to that single decision right there um and it, it it literally cost me years of progress in my company because i thought because i was good at one thing that meant i was going to automatically be good at two other things in the same industry and it cost me years there we go all right all right rj what about you steve what's uh, been most costly answer wisely uh i would say number one um, kind of like RJ kind of suggested, I would say start and part into disruption because I think it's cost me personal capital. Like these are my friends. Like what does this <laughs> say about me? Right. Um, right behind that was when I first started in 07, thinking that paying 18% hard money is stupid when I should have used as much hard money as possible to buy assets for 40, 50 K that are now worth 400, $500,000. Right. There was a lot of opportunity costs there. And right behind that, I would say number three was learning about wholesaling in 2007 and thinking it was a fad. That was stupid, right? I thought this is this is going to change when the market turns around. So I would say those two between not buying, not borrowing at 18 percent and thinking wholesaling is a fad probably cost me a lot of money. Absolutely, and PTDs only elevated your game, Steve. Let's be honest. So let's just go ahead and never speak bad about the greatest performing show that you have. All right, let's let's just go there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Brewer, what about you? Most costly? Oh, man. Uh, there's a long list of mistakes. How do you figure out which one is most costly? I would say, um, so I've done over 3,500 real estate deals. I would say not keeping 25% of those deals over the last 17 years has been the most costly. Now we, we bought them, we renovated them, we sold them, we bought them, we wholesaled them, we made money, um, but it pales in comparison to the significant wealth I would have today. Um, had I kept, you know, 25%, it's a small amount. One out of every four deals you cherry pick, you set aside and you keep it. I think if I were to look back over the the body of work over the last 17 years that I've done, most of it I've, I'm very proud of. Um, that one part eats away at me. Um, and if I start to do the math, which I was doing while Steve was answering, because it was the best use of my time, um, it's a Fair. big number. It's a very big number, and it makes me a little nauseous. So I'm going to crumble that little piece of paper up. I'm going to throw that right in the trash. Uh, I don't need that negativity in my life, but that's the most costly mistake. That's a very positive number. It's not a negative number. That's a positive yeah, number. Yeah, not, not having a, an awareness about you know the long-term game and playing a short-term game. There we go. Somebody clearly gave Brewer a Snickers. You know, he's, he's coming around. He's... He's getting back to the EB that we all love. All right, Leon, what about you? Most costly? Made a lot of mistakes, as Eric was mentioning earlier. I think all of us that are continuing to try to be better, make mistakes along the way, it makes us better. Um, I look at when I heard this question, I think about the things that I regret. Like I, I go, man, I wish I would have done this, to Eric's point, held more, uh, even though I've, I've held a lot. Um, during that run of 2019 to just – the spring of 2022, um, man, that was a time I should have doubled down more. 
and purchase more because the upside of those assets of holding them, but also, and the interest rates at the time, obviously, um, I regret not doing more in that, in that time frame. The other thing that I think sometimes gets lost is the opportunity missed by doing something early and paying dividends later. Like I look at the optimization of being on Google, not only in one market, but multiple markets and optimize at a high level, that digital real estate, not whatever virtual world that Steve was buying into. I'm talking about search engine optimization for multiple markets to capture leads and buying into that at an earlier time frame. I look back and go, man, why was I not doing that 10 years ago? To, to gain that spot and hold that spot because there's so much missed opportunity um, when you're not represented in that digital space. I don't know if there's much debate here since when they were all of our mistakes, but I mean, I, I think the, the lesson for people listening to this to take away is, is that um, despite all of our mistakes, when you look back at it, we found ways to overcome them and push forward. And um, I think all of us have learned. I mean, I know Eric's keeping a lot more now than what he's selling. So, Eric, I mean, are you now on pace to keep one out of every four deals? Yeah. Well, and, and the way that I so I'm trying to make up for lost time is now I'm specifically going after portfolios, right? So, it's like, <laughs> I, 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 so you know, in true visionary fact, I can't wait long enough, right? So, like now I'm trying to hopefully we're closing this month on a 300 unit apartment building, trying to make up for lost time, um, you know. But uh, I think to to RJ's point, what he's alluding to is I actually struggle to identify them as mistakes. I had someone ask me at a mastermind, he was like 23 years old. And he goes, what would you go back and do differently? And I thought about it and I said, nothing. And he's like, ah, come on. Like, you mean you did everything perfect? I said, no, that's the opposite of what I'm saying. I, I think for these four of us sitting here, right? It's like, I love my life. I love the, the struggle. I love the wins. I love the people I'm with. I love you know, what, what causes me grief. I embrace it all. And I would be fearful. And here's, what's funny. I said, it's kind of like back to the future. Now you remember the guy's 23 years old. He looks at me like cross-eyed mm -hmm. kind of like Steve. And he goes, what's <laughs> Jesus. What's back to the future. And I go, what? Wow. wow. <laughs> I mean, the movie Michael J. Fox and he was puzzled. And I said, Hey, I, I I'm fearful that if I went back RJ and changed that stuff, that it somehow would modify the life that I live now, or I wouldn't have been able to bring that experience to today. Um, so I think, you know, what you're recognizing is a symbol of, of great leadership from everybody here that although we recognize them as mistakes, we're, we're also thankful for it. And we've learned something from it, which is actually probably more valuable than the money we may have had, or more valuable than the deal we would have had, or more valuable than anything else. That legacy that we leave mm -hmm. is, is that, that, that knowledge and that experience. And then we're able to, share those behaviors and beliefs with other people. I said, uh, this, just a, I said this yesterday um, to someone. I, I was on a call and I was talking about success and getting to that point of success. It's usually just time and execution, right? And then you have mistakes that are along the way that make you better. And you either have to have a bunch of grays on the side like I do, or you look like Eric and, and Matt. You got to get to that point where you've got some experience. But to Eric's point, he made a very valid point there. And I've said this before, whether you're in CG, Well Club, or, 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 or Family Mastermind, or any of these communities, the best way to make sure that you have that success before you get grazed and go bald is to find yourself a community. He just had a question from a 23-year-old that was a part of a community that was asking a mentor, a sage advice of what mistakes, you know, what, what, what do you regret, right? He's asking for so he doesn't make those same mistakes and maybe he still makes some of them, but his learning curve is going to be much, much less. He's going to have less mistakes made because he's asking and in a room with people like Eric. Eric, to to counter what you're talking about here, you know, uh, we've heard other friends say the best way to buy uh, passive income by rental properties is to make a lot of active income, which is a little bit different. And keeping one out of every four. So what would you say to someone that has that perspective? 
it's the balance, right? Like it's, I think what you have to define is how much active income do you need to spend, right? Because if you're making a million, two million bucks a year and you're not putting a million five of that to work, A, you're going to give four or $500,000 back to the government, which is a complete waste. Waste. Right. So it's like define what active income you need to live off of, make five, 10 times more than that and invest 75% of it. Right. Which was into rentals or whatever it is. Um, but I, I, I think it's the bo it's both. Right. You heard me say it all the time. The power of and it's not make a bunch of active income or passive. It's both. Right. So because the more active you make, first of all, it's generally not passive. And, and if it is, it's not through rental properties. That's probably one of the biggest myths is that rentals is passive income. It's, it's not, it's, it's passive aggressive income. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that's what it is, it, but it's not passive. So I, I think you have to do both. You make a boatload of passive income or, or active income, live off a, a fraction of that, right? Live a comfortable life, buy the car, buy the house, you know, do that stuff. But there has to be a commitment to building that that sort of war chest of potential passive income over time. But you might be oversimplifying it, right? Like the guy that the person you were when you could have when you wanted when you wish you would have kept one out every four, you needed that active income, right? Or am I mistaken? Because a lot of us when we're, when we're selling these properties, it's not because we don't want to keep them. Is it's two things. A, we need that active income and B, we've lost sight of why we're doing what we're doing. You mean lose sight by like the reason we probably started it was to create freedom and passive income. Right. And now yeah. you're a, basically you're a, you're a servant to that P and L and, and you, you yeah. work twice as hard. Yeah, I agree. That's a whole deeper conversation. I, I get it. All that I'm saying is if it's one out of every five deals, that one deal should not be the difference between being profitable and losing money. It's the difference between putting a hundred grand in your pocket and putting 60 grand in your pocket. And you ought to be able to make it work off 60. It's funny though. If you really look at mine and Eric's answers, they're the polar opposite of each other. Eric's answer Nothing. is, I wish I would have kept more properties. And mine is, I wish I wouldn't have tried to keep as many because it damn near bankrupted me because I wasn't ready. So my thing is, is I was, I was Eric now without his team, without his systems, without his process, just the mindset. It was like, no, we're going to keep one out of every, no, actually, we're going to wholesale one out of every four. We're going to keep three because that's how we're really going to make wealth. And we're going to eat shit for right now and, and not have any active <laughs> income. But in 20 years, I'm going to be the dude, you know, and then it's like, oh, wow, I wasted five years of my life. I think that's a perfect segue to close this, right, is, is, is everything that you hear from us needs to be taken with this filter of, where am I? Right. Mm -hmm. Like this, this, the advice that RJ and, and, and myself and Leon and Steve and Matt give you is always with a bias of where we are now. Like that's, I actually was saying, when you talk about start wholesaling, I actually hate that question and no offense to anybody that's just getting started. It's super exciting, but it forces me to go back into this like infant stage of my business thinking that I don't love being in tune with, right? I don't want to think about what it's like to have to operate with no marketing budget. I don't want to, and there's a phase, it's a season of your business, but I think it's really hard for us to give those types of answers because the majority of us are pretty far disconnected from what it's like to start, right? Mm -hmm. We're starting something bigger. We're starting something new. We're starting something to, to, to double or 10 X what we're doing. It challenges me. Um, to think about what it would be like to start. And I don't necessarily like it because I think the answer oftentimes is work that I might not be willing or even capable of doing anymore. This is why I start that particular question. I started with, it depends on what your end game is, right? And where you are today and what your end game is. The thing I've been most impressed with the investor between 20 and 30 years old that maybe only in this business, three to five years got in at COVID. The thing I've been most impressed about that investor is what's different from us that are 40 plus that have been in the game for a little while now. They design their business, most, not all, they design their business around who they want to become and the lifestyle that they want to live, which I've been super, super impressed with. So if there's a, 
if there's anywhere you should start, look at where you are today and where do you want to be and then design that as much as you possibly can. Obviously, there's going to be imbalance out of the gates and you're going to have to grind and do those type of things, but build it with the end in mind. I think so I think apologize what's, you know, what Eric. comes to mind is like these seasons of suffering. There's there's certainly going to be one, if not maybe more, seasons of suffering throughout your entrepreneurial journey, right? Um, RJ saw it like maybe in the beginning or closer to the middle when he made a strategic decision and he said he wasn't ready. Um, some of that suffering for me probably settled in after I got to 15 years in the business and realized I'd done 3,000 deals and started looking back and going, why didn't I do that differently? Mm -hmm. But you do need to be prepared for some level of suffering throughout that entrepreneurial journey. Hopefully it's shorter. It's only once, right? It doesn't break you. But if we're being honest, I think the best advice you can give to people is you need to be mentally prepared for some level of suffering. Yeah, it's yeah. we over glamorize it sometimes. And, and the reality of the story is, is there's there's more of those seasons than most of us would be proud of. And we're constantly trying <laughs> to work our way away from the suffering. But it's it's a constant element of, of being an entrepreneur and a business owner. It's definitely true. There's a lot of suffering, you know, and I think um, I think you owe Eric an apology. I think he's in his 50s and I think RJ's in his 30s. <laughs> I, I am in my 30s. I am not in my 50s. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, Close. you look weathered. He's, we were learning about weather. I, I do get in the fifties when Steve guards me in basketball, though. I can tell you that. <laughs> Kobe, I was worried where that one was going for a second, but okay. Quick, this was such a good question. Um, our two other panelists sent me a text and gave their answers. Potter, can I read them to you real quick? Sure. Jimmy V said uh, his answer is he's never made a mistake, so he couldn't have answered this. <laughs> and uh, CJ said the most costly mistake that he's ever made is capping his Thursday webinars to 3000 instead of 5000 <laughs> If he had done that, he would be way wealthier. So those are their, their two answers. I'm just super I'm, thought out. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> good Lord. All right. That was a really great question with a lot of good um, back and forth. A lot of information there. Um, Brewer, I have to say that you, while you, you know, clearly exceeded your 45 seconds and or everyone's two minutes. You had some great points there. I'm going to go ahead and award a point to you. Also to my man, Leon over here, because, you know, per usual, he comes in with good, uh, good thoughts. And the winner today, because we have a three-way tie at the moment, goes to the man in Denver, Colorado, for having the best backdrop I think we've ever seen on this show. Nice. Like, nice. let's be honest. Like, it is – you know, RJ, if we just left the original sign back there, bro, I, I think that would have swung it. Like, I'm just letting you know. You know, I'm just trying to help you out here. Um, but I'm glad to see the Brewers in a better mood. He got, you know, a little bit more energized at the end. Like I said, he got a Snickers. And Steve, we, we appreciate you showing up as always. All right, everybody. It was a fun show today. We appreciate everyone tuning in, checking us out on YouTube at Pardon the Disruption. I'm your host, Matthew Potter. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. We will see you guys again next week. We're going to go ahead and let everybody do a send-off. Leon, start with you. Great show, as always, guys. Lots of great information from guys that every one of I know we 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 joke a lot, but I, I respect it, each and every one of you and consider you leaders and friends. Lead on. Great show, guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, RJ, say bye to the people. Yeah, great show. Super excited. Uh, just got a notification that uh, my package for Tampa showed up. Um, I am going to be showing up for our live part of the disruption. I'm going to be dyeing my hair uh, blonde. I'm going to be cutting the beard into a uh, Fu Manchu. I'm going to be going full on Hulk mania, <laughs> at the family mastermind, and I'm going to rip my shirt off on stage. <laughs> And shine Eric Brewer's head with it. Wow. <laughs> uh, I'm here for that. Between that and Steve just bouncing on Eric's knee, like, I'm here for it. All right, Steve, say bye to the people. Just get me out of the way before he attacks Eric. That's all I ask, right? <laughs> just just protect me, save me. Um, I think it's a great show, and I think there's a lot of uh, really deep uh, uh, thought, and we shared a lot of our, our struggles, and I think that is just – a reminder for everyone, right? When you go through this journey, there's going to be seasons of suffering. I think that's a great way to put it. So uh, I hope everyone got a ton of value and a great show as always. And uh, just keep me safe from RJ, please.
<laughs> yeah, I promise nothing on that one. Brewer, <laughs> say bye to the people. Uh, yeah, today was a good show. Shout out to uh, the PTD staff, the questions. I think today, uh, one of the best um, assembly of questions I heard. Um, kind of like uh, fresh off COVID RJ. He's like still a little like Rammy, right? Um, but like a little... <laughs> He's, he's dialed back a little bit, right? Like, um, kind of like that guy. Um, <laughs> shout out to Leon. Don't forget the G Barnes. I want to make sure everybody's celebrated. Uh, by the way, RJ, back-to-back closer Olympics champion. I don't feel we did a good enough job. <laughs> that. Um, Potter. There we go. There we uh, go. I don't really have anything for Steve, but that's the best way to, to <laughs> celebrate Steve is to not really have a reason to celebrate. Um, and then uh, I would just say respectfully, shout out to my bank account in celebration of DJ. Oh, and then uh, Jimmy, I would just say, um, what's his? Oh. <clears throat> right? He's a grunt. The guy spent 33% of his life in a foxhole. He doesn't have much to say or add. Um, but I do like him. Um so wow. that was it. I just, it's never, and in typical Eric fashion, it's never about me. It's about everybody else. And I wanted to close that way. Wow. That was outstanding. Thank you for the send off brewer. That one may go down in the record books. All right, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. We will see you guys again next week.